Hi. You guys are so, sub is it too cold? Is that why you're so subdued? <laughs> we were just talking. Cecile and I are from Texas. I'm like, anything below 80 is freezing. And of course, Carrie's family's from the Caribbean. We're like, turn the heat up. Jeez. Hi, ladies. How you Hi, feeling? Ladies. I know. <laughs> I, this is, cannot be. All of these women, all of these amazing faces, brilliant minds, and y'all are just too subdued. I could go back to bed. I live around the corner. Hello, <laughs> ladies. Hi. All right. Woo. That's what right. we're talking about. It's so interesting. Um, actually, the way we said hello and just that interaction ties into the panel. We're discussing sparking a movement, mm -hmm. how to get people motivated. Look how hard it was just to get you to say hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now imagine if you are addressing more complicated subjects, more difficult subjects, subjects that, quite honestly, people know are a problem but are hesitant or even afraid as with domestic violence awareness to discuss out open. So we have this incredible panel assembled because each of you in your own way have used your voices in I think a revolutionary way, whether it's on social media, whether it's expanding the horizon of Planned Parenthood and who should support the organization, or awakening our eyes, Janet, in ways that we never imagined. So Carrie, I'll start with you because much of our friendship started kind of on Twitter. You launched right. into Twitter in a way that no one had ever done, not for a show, but for awareness of causes that mean so much to you. Yeah, it's funny. Um, a lot of what I want to talk about today is my work with the Allstate Foundation Purple Purse because they came to me three years ago and I, you know, I'm not in the business world in the way that so many of you are and so I was like, why is Allstate calling me? I do not need insurance. I'm good. <laughs> um, and I had just had my, my child and I, I was really, they were like, they want you to do a purse. I was like, design a purse for an insurance company? What? I don't understand. And they came to me and said, we know that you're passionate about women's empowerment and ending violence against women. I had worked with V-Day for a long time and we know you're passionate about fashion, and you, we have an opportunity for you to bring those things together. So purple is the color for domestic violence awareness, and a purse is a symbol for where a woman keeps her financial domain. We design a purple purse every year to bring awareness and funding to financial abuse. I had never heard of financial abuse, um, which I thought was an issue because I work in this space, but financial abuse is any time that a woman's access to money, credit cards, transportation is threatened. It is present in 99% of domestic violence situations. It's the number one reason that women stay in abusive relationships because they don't feel like they can take care of themselves financially. And it's the number one reason why women go back so I felt like designing this purse to give us an easy way to talk about a difficult issue, I could have a real tangible impact on changing women's lives, saving lives. Mm. And Cecile, so much of sparking a movement, quite honestly, and, and we all know this, decisions are often, too often made in rooms where women are not included. That's right. Where there is no diversity. Yes. And I'm just gonna keep it 100, it's usually an old white dude. Mm -hmm. No offense to old white dudes, but, <laughs> so don't tweet that I said anything controversial. But in reality, <laughs> I will block and delete you. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But You're the reality not. of it is, whether it's women's issues, I mean, talk about the healthcare debate, right. Planned Parenthood, we see these images and the people who believe they are sparking the movement are often not the faces that you see here. Right. And you have, again, opened the door to what we see as our democracy and our voice with Planned Parenthood. Thank you, and yes, I mean, the issue that I work on 100% every day is women's health and access to health care that's affordable and high quality, and as everyone knows, this is the topic that is uh, it, right in the center of what's happening in Washington, D.C., and you're right that the decisions that are being made now about, frankly, the health care for every single person in this room are being made by men exclusively in the United States Senate right now. In fact, they're not even letting people see the bill. There was a wonderful meme that went out that some of you may have seen that uh, I think really captured that of, of a, a bunch of golden retrievers sitting at, around a, a table deciding on feline health care. And I think that actually, to me, captures how it feels to be a, a woman uh, or someone who's relying on either Planned Parenthood or access to affordable health care and see folks who have no idea what it's like to worry about uh, an unintended pregnancy or worry about a lump in your breast and is there some place that you can go, not in a month or two months, but right now and get it checked out. These are the issues that are actually getting decided in Washington right now. And the one thing I will say, since I know we're talking about movements, is that 
Women are leading the movement in this country. For anyone who went to the women's marches, the largest marches in the history of the United States of America, incredible. Um, folks marching in Antarctica, for God's sake. Uh, but that has just continued. In fact, one of, the, one of the notes I saw was that the 86% of the calls they estimate going into Congress uh, in opposition to this health care bill are coming from women. And women. so I do think it's an important time. Women have the power to make a huge change, not only in their own lives and their own communities, but frankly, in the direction of the country. Can I just yeah. add to that, that I think what's so important about the two things we discussed so far is that silencing us is a big part of disempowering us. That it's not having the information, not knowing what to call financial abuse, not knowing what's in the bill, not having the information is how we are disempowered. So a big part of it is of creating change is creating opportunities for discussion, creating ways to say, how can we talk about this? How can we make communities? How can we make safe spaces for us to dive into the information so that we're not walking around blindfolded around the issues that matter to us most? Because a lot of society says, you shouldn't talk about women's health care. You shouldn't talk about domestic violence. You shouldn't talk about transgender identity. You should not talk about things that make other people uncomfortable. But things that make us uncomfortable in conversation are things that are threatening our lives. So we have to talk about them and we have to find ways to make talking about them okay and it's so interesting Janet bringing you into the conversation on sparking a movement because you are creating a template I mean I, Cecile doesn't know the story I grew up in Texas Luling Texas population 2000 I didn't have Michael Jackson photos on my wall I had Ann Richards <laughs> her mom the great governor of Texas was my idol and I thought this <laughs> You know, I'm like, I'm gonna dye my hair white. <laughs> I'm like 17, I'm like, this is my whole image of what a badass woman is. And it was Ann Richards. And in here we've all had our influences. Diane Carroll, you've talked about as well for you. Your template, you are the template. Mm. I mean, you, you are the mold breaker. Yeah. You're the damn mold. You're everything. <laughs> and how, how challenging is that for you when, unlike, three of us here, you didn't have an exact person mm. to say, this is someone I can follow to spark a movement of education about what your life means to others. Well, it's, it was incredibly difficult to navigate, but what was so great was that I did have some pieces, or like I created my own mosaic or kaleidoscope of so many different people that I could look to. I, How did it, you do that? Well, it started at my, you know, I would say my grandmother's kitchen tables. My maternal grandmother's native Hawaiian. She grew up in public housing. She's indigenous to the islands of Oahu. And I also had my, you know, black grandmother in Dallas, Texas, Shelly Shelley Jean Gibson, and she was a mold for me, and both of them what they did so well, even though they had different life experiences, was that they spoke about feminism in a way without using all of the language, right? They spoke it plain, they spoke it accessibly, and they spoke it powerfully. Um, I went into the academy, the first person in my family to go to college on both sides, and I remember just hearing and learning all of this jargon, but then going back to the kitchen table with my family and not necessarily knowing how to bring that jargon to them in a way that spoke to them. And so, so much of the work that I do is about unpacking complicated, nuanced, multi-layered, intersectional issues in ways that people can take and grab with them and then go and spread that message. Give me an example, because as Carrie pointed out, a lot of these things are difficult topics for people mm -hmm. to address for a myriad of reasons. So as they say, the elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. In sparking the movement, mm -hmm. how did you make this complicated topic accessible? I started with just the revolutionary power of storytelling. I told one story, which was mine. I offered people language, I offered people definitions. Literally in my first book, Redefining Realness, I wrote, I identify as trans, comma, trans is an umbrella term that describes people, da 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 You know, pronouns, pronouns are choices that we make every single day that all of us use. Gender is one of the first, you know, um, ways in which we categorize each other. We go from dogs, when you meet someone's dog, you're like, is it a boy or a girl? I don't know why it matters that humans need to know if a dog is a boy or a girl, but that's what we do. Are you having a boy or a girl? You know, I don't know if it matters, if, but so like all of these things I try to create the, these ways in which we can be tethered to one another and tie things and going back to your first question about how did I do it um, I think that for me there was no other choice I was so lucky there were so many times that I could have been beaten that I could have been um, jailed that I could have been pushed out of school um, and I persevered 
And I thought that because I persevered, because I was lucky enough to make it to the other side, that part of my payback was to ensure that I was bringing other people in with me. And the first step that I took as a writer was to ensure that I, was, that I stood up in my truth and that I told my story. And then as I told my story, I ensured that it linked to so many different people that may have had different experiences with me, but still carry that same label of trans woman of color. You know, Cecile, picking up a little bit on what Janet said as well, bringing in the conversation allies. And I jokingly said, you know, these decisions are made um, where we are not often in the room. That's right. That is a serious joke. We know the numbers. And you mentioned the numbers statistically of women who are now calling on Congress. But we know to move legislation, our allies have to be from all walks of life. We need, we need men. We need women. We need people from the South. We need people who may not agree with everything that Planned Parenthood does, but they agree with the necessity of an organization like Planned Parenthood. So in sparking the movement, what were the challenges in bringing in people who were not traditional supporters of Planned Parenthood? Well, one thing I think is incredibly important, and just referring back to the marches, is how many men were marching. I, I mean, brothers and sons and fathers Dads. and grandfathers. And I think, I do think we're at this tipping point in, in America where fathers actually want their daughters and believe their daughters should have every single opportunity that their sons have, whether it's to finish school or to have a career. And that's a big cultural shift. Uh, so that's one way I think that, we, that uh, we bring folks in. But I think it's interesting, and I really want to thank Forbes for having this summit, because to Carrie's point, we do need rooms where we can have these kind of conversations. And so I'm incredibly grateful. But one of the things that's important, and I've been talking to many business leaders, we've had incredible support from Fashion Stands with Planned Parenthood. I really want to call out Tracy Reese and Anna Wintour and Diane von Furstenberg and a lot of women who said these are issues that affect our employees, they affect our industry. Uh, we have Tech Stands with Planned Parenthood. And I think it's because th the fundamental ability for women to participate in the workforce and to do the work in the companies that all of you represent is their ability to access healthcare and to make decisions about when and whether they have children. I mean, we look at 100 years ago, before birth control was legal, when Planned Parenthood first started, uh, women were virtually not in any, any uh, kind of career. Today, women are half the workforce in America. We are in every single industry. The, the recent graduating class of NASA astronauts was half women. That's when you know you've really arrived, right? And I, so I, I do think it's important, Cameron, as we talk about these issues, um, for most women, the issue of being able to make these determinations are not social issues, they're not political issues, they're fundamental healthcare issues. And when we reframe that, I think when we reach out to a business community who needs, if we're gonna grow this economy, as some people in Washington say they wanna do, you can't do that with leaving half of the workforce behind. Mm, and that's something we have to get serious about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, Carrie, much of, of your career, obviously people focus on the actor, Kerry Washington, but the philanthropist, the person who, again, like Janet, like Cecile, you, you created a template that almost did not exist, and by becoming the boss in many ways, mm -hmm. um, you make Cecile's point about if it's half the workforce, are we bringing in, in enough women to spark the movement? So in your industry, how do you feel your work and what you represent and I know this is kind of putting you in a situation where you kind of brag on yourself, but, but it's, I mean, that's also another issue they say we as women have, that we're not able to say what we've accomplished and what we've mm. done um, without feeling gun shy about it, so to speak. But, but some of the things that you've done as of late, especially in your industry, how do you feel it's been received and sparking a movement, not to have women's faces on TV, but to have us in powerful positions so that we can empower others? It's interesting, I often feel like, you know, because of what I do for a living, people always question whether I should be as outspoken as I am about women in my business, about women's issues, about women's empowerment, about our democracy in general. Um, and, and people said to me, like, you know, we know that you're interested in fashion, but should you really be taking on these larger issues about women's financial empowerment and, and women's financial independence? And I, I've, always, I've always said that because I am an artist doesn't mean that I don't get to have my voice. You know, that every single one of us in this room, we have a responsibility to 
stand strong, to tell our story, to encourage others to participate, to shine a light and give another woman a hand up. We really do have that responsibility. And because I'm an artist doesn't mean I'm going to forego that responsibility so that I don't lose ratings or people don't buy my magazine. Like, what I am, who I am is who I am, and you can take it or leave it. It's a great thing about living in the country we live in. You can take it or leave it. Um, but I firmly believe that for us, that part of my blessing to have been able to accomplish some of the things I've been able to accomplish in my job is to be able to pay that forward and make sure that other women have some of that same information. When I say, and I want all three of you to answer if you can, I'll start with Janet, change agent. Mm. What does that mean to you? Mm. I think someone that has used their, um, the access they've been given to be a Trojan horse, to blow up spaces, and to make people think differently, act differently, and mobilize. Mm. Cecile? So I think every person and every woman now who is taking on just that much more than they ever thought they could do is a change agent. And that's what has been so exciting to me to see. Uh, and I want to particularly just um, acknowledge when Janet said women telling or people telling their stories, it begins to open up the world in a different kind of way. And the, the work that Carrie's done, the work that Shonda Rhimes has done in terms of bringing different kinds of stories to everybody on Thursday night television is one way of doing it. But what I'm really seeing is the courage of women just living their lives who never thought they would be called upon to tell their story. Um, I was just in Wisconsin with a woman who was a Planned Parenthood patient we had detected her ovarian cysts, and it's a, it's a complicated story, but very common story, and because of the treatment she got, she's able to have her daughter, who's now 14, and she was saying to me, I was always a very quiet person, but um, now I feel like I can't be quiet anymore, and not only, so she was there to tell her story, uh, she's now organized Forward Kenosha of 1,300 women in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and I got an email the other day from someone saying, her name's Lori, she said, Lori Hawkins has used you for a reference because she'd like to run for office. Could you, um, could you tell us something about her? <laughs> and so I think that's what... I think it can be mystifying that people think to be a change agent, you somehow have to be doing some certain set of things. I think every single one of us, it's incumbent on us for every one of us to be a change agent. Absolutely, that is beautiful. Yeah. Gary, how do you define I think of a lot about the, you know, the Allstate Foundation Purple Purse, what they do is we create these curriculums to give women the tools to be able to save money, make money, save money. We made a PSA last year about a woman who actually took cash and used to roll it up and stick it into the tampon tubes because it was the one place that she knew her husband wouldn't look until she could save enough money to escape. And because of the foundation, she, ha she felt like she had the money but also the know-how of how to use that money, how to invest that money, how to save that money, how to get her next job, how to move, how to, how to build her credit. She had the tools to be able to change her life. And I think about her kids because abuse is generational, you know, and for her to be able to, to make that change in her own life means that her children will be able to continue to live now in, a, in an environment free of abuse and continue change forward and maybe run for office one day. You know, that, that, that change, on, I know a lot of us are having complicated, elevated conversations about economics today and about business, but for us, particularly I want to say this in this room, at the Allstate Foundation, for Purple Purse, if you feel like you can contribute to, I think partnership is so important. And, and if you are hearing something today from me where you feel like you can contribute to what we're doing at Purple Purse through any resources or assistance or social media or any way, please come to us, let us know, tweet us, call us. We are open to partnership through the three years that I've been involved. We've involved more and more designers, more and more advocates, more and more change. Um, and I think I think that's a big reason, a part of why we're all here today, that as women, we can use this opportunity to connect with each other. So really, as you're listening today, don't be shy. Yeah. Don't sit back. Go up to the person who's doing something that you admire and say, how can I help? And here's how you can help me. That that is how we'll continue to lift each other. Absolutely. And you both gave, I think, phenomenal examples of your work and how you're seeing the results in the community. Janet, what are you seeing as far as the movement that you've sparked? And it, coming back to you in return from community advocacy? 
What's been so amazing, you know, I was, uh, me and Cecile were, we saw each other backstage in the holding area at the Women's March on Washington and it was so powerful to be a part of that. I, I helped, um, I was one of 13 women who helped craft the policy um, document, which was the guiding, vi um, the vision principles for the Women's March. And in that space, there was another trans woman of color who took the space and also spoke. Her name is Raquel Willis, and she's been a mentee of mine for many years, um, someone who has read my work and been fulfilled by that. And so to see her on that stage, to see her making um, comments, um, remarks about our communities and centering ourselves in a space that so often, you know, when people talk about women's spaces, so often, you know, trans women are not included in those spaces, not necessarily that we need to be centered in every space, but I think even the possibility that there are young trans girls who are existing and living as young girls are not included in our, in our movements, in our space, I think is, is vital for us to speak about more often. Um, and so for me, I always look to the work of someone like Miss Major Griffin Gracie. You know, you, you mentioned it was a beautiful compliment to say that there is no blueprints, but I remember seeing Miss Major Griffin Gracie, and she's an activist for many years. She's in her 70s, and she just moved, talking about a change, she just moved from the Bay Area where she has organized for three decades and moved down to the South to help the girls down there organize, mm. to give them the tools to show them a blueprint. You know, she has done vital, important work that has enabled our movements to keep going. And so for me, um, thinking about, you know, I'm going to say, you know, 45's name, Donald Trump, um, I think that this, like, kind of the boogeyman of them that no one's talking about on this stage, but it has affected women on so many levels, and the fact that we're not speaking that plainly, that we're not saying that this is a part of the way in which why so many women showed up, That's right. right, the fact of being targeted, the fact of being told that their rights are going to be taken from them, that that energized a lot of people, and so for me, when I was on that stage at the Women's March on Washington, I thought about how many people in that audience were finally, for the first time in their lives activating. And there's such power in that activation in all of us gathering yes. and hearing one another and seeing one another and seeing the ways in which our separate liberations and experiences are directly linked to one another. Well, and you make an interesting point mm -hmm. referring right. to what people might see as the elephant in the room, but, but I'll push it further. How do we ensure that women know that they're stakeholders no matter who is in the White House? Mm. Because it yep. doesn't, and it can't be a four or eight year no, calendar. Mm -hmm. And there's still a lot of autopsy, if you will, over what happened in the election. But what we do know is that there were so many women who did not feel that they were stakeholders mm -hmm. in what was playing out there. Mm -hmm. So how, after you know, 10 more years of whatever happens, do you ensure with your voices that more women believe that they are stakeholders, more people mm -hmm. in what your messages are? Well, one thing, I'd, and, and thanks, Janet, for, for that, because I, look, uh, women are the majority of this country. Women of color? Let's say that again. Women are the majority of this country. Okay. So, um, and, and women of color in particular, I think we don't say it enough, they did show up in this election and they did vote and we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. They did their part and now it's incumbent on all the rest of us to do ours. And I do think it's really important that we raise this because the single institution that has the most impact on our lives, our rights, the future for our children is government. Mm -hmm. So marching is great, going to town hall meetings in your pink hats is great, calling Congress is great, voting is essential. And if women can figure that out, we absolutely, mm -hmm. uh, with allies, can change um, the direction of this country. But I also think it's important that, um, and I just want to say to Janet, and then uh, I feel like Laverne Cox is incredibly helpful to me too, as we thought about Planned Parenthood expanding healthcare, because we provide healthcare to one in five women in this country at some point in their lifetime. But now, increasingly, we see LGBT patients, we see folks who want non-judgmental care. We, we have now expanded trans services in several states, and it's continuing to open up. Because these issues do transcend yes. barriers. And the need for non-judgmental, high-quality, affordable health care is something that everyone in this country, this is not a women's issue. This is an American issue. And so it is incumbent on all of us, not only to stand up for what we believe we deserve, but what we believe every single Absolutely. person in this country Absolutely. deserves. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Um, um, the last five minutes, I'm going to... 
pick out two people and you get a chance to ask a question and you can tweet it out and all that good stuff. But <laughs> <laughs> and don't ask, did we coordinate? Because we didn't. We didn't. We did not. <laughs> we all walked in like, really? This, this is amazing. <laughs> Carrie said we couldn't have planned this color coordination if we tried. But before I turn it over to a couple of questions, <laughs> Carrie, what compels you mm. to be an agent of change to spark a movement? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think what compels me is gratitude. I feel so blessed to be born to this country. I feel so blessed to be a woman. I feel so blessed to be a person of color. I feel so blessed to be from the boogie down Bronx. Like I just have, <laughs> I have so many things to be grateful for. And, um, and so I think part of my wanting, my, my march toward change is so, is so that I never feel that those things are limiting factors, oh, yeah. that those are parts of the mosaic of who I am, but that they don't somehow put a limit to my trajectory, that they're just part of the gifts of me. And I think also, I think about my kids now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah. Still, what compels you? So, um, well, I have been also incredibly blessed and have always had the chance to work in something I really felt passionate about. And too many people, millions of women in this country they're, they never have that opportunity, so I feel incredibly grateful. But for me, because uh, right now it's kind of a tough time, as folks probably know, they're trying to end access to Planned Parenthood in this bill before Congress. But I know that every single day that I get up and we keep our doors open, approximately 8,118 people get affordable health care from Planned Parenthood. And that is incredibly motivating, and it keeps me going. So, Janet. I don't think I have any other option. You know, I, the first thing I learned about myself was that I was black, native, Hawaiian, and poor. And the next <laughs> layer of that was that I'm trans. And so in a sense, it was like I was kind of born to be outraged. But what, <laughs> but what keeps me going is the, the sense that there's so much hope. I see so much work, you know. I think about all of my sisters and my siblings who I fight alongside, who I kiki and laugh and giggle and gossip alongside when I see their joy in the face of so many insurmountable hurdles and obstacles and that they can still laugh, <clears throat> that they can still go out and organize, that they can still go and, you know, with their underfunded movements, go and still try to create change, try to run for government, try to do all of these things that, who am I to, who am I to not be compelled to go and do this work and to link arms, you know, um, unabashedly, unapologetically, and fiercely alongside them. And so that's what keeps me going. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I'm going to turn it over to a couple of questions. And I think that there's so much more to discuss, but, but something that I get from the things that I've heard from the three of you, my own personal story like you, born to be outraged. My grandfather had a second grade education. Mm. I didn't have paved streets until the 80s. Mm. I knew more about cows than I knew about anything else by the time I was 16. I can barbecue better than any guy you've ever met. <laughs> uh, don't let the Dolce fool you. It's like, you know, I have a tough guy inside, a, te a tough Texan man somewhere is inside of me. Um, so that's the name of my book. Um, but, but I think the commonality that I hope that we have with all of you is this thirst for authenticity, this thirst to be inclusive, but to understand that outrage is not an outlier. It doesn't mean you're angry. It doesn't mean that we hate men or that we don't want everyone to be in the party, but we want what we are, which is the majority in this country, to be reflective. We don't all think the same. We won't all subscribe to the same philosophies politically, emotionally. Our backgrounds are very different. But what we are, we are the fertile ground. And I don't mean that in a biological sense. I mean that in an emotional, spiritual sense. We are the fertile ground for what this world is to be. So I think what we've heard from these amazing women, I hope have inspired you. So I'm gonna just, since we both have all pink and white, I'm picking out one person with pink, I'm just gonna be superficial. Who has on pink and has a question? <laughs> <laughs> Who has on white and has a question? Cause I just, I, I, it's like picking my favorite child among all of you. <laughs> Ma'am, yeah, you get your chance. Well I have on black, but I'm still not <laughs> oh, no. Be radical, be <laughs> radical. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for the work that all of you do. My question's for Cecile. Mm -hmm. What can we do at this tumultuous moment in time? What do you need the most from us as individuals? 
Thanks so much. Um, and the most important thing that you can do, even if you've already done it a million times, is call your United States Senator and Member of Congress. People wonder all the time, does it matter? And I can tell you, it's the only thing that does right now. Change is not going to happen in Washington, D.C. It's going to happen in Ohio and Wisconsin mm -hmm. and Texas and New York and places where people pick up the phone and call. So call your member of Congress. If you don't know what to say, you can text DEFENDER at 22422. That's at Planned Parenthood, and we will tell you exactly what's going on. Uh, and you can go to istandwithplannedparenthood.org and sign up. I, it's, it is really, it is so important that women feel empowered right now because I think Carrie's point was really right. If you look at what's happening in Washington, it can be very discouraging. But this bill to end access to Planned Parenthood, to repeal all the benefits that we fought for, birth control, maternity coverage, not having to pay more for health insurance, all the things that are now at risk, that bill was supposed to be on the president's desk January 27th. And I think today is June something or other. That's because people marched and stood up and called their member of Congress. So please, if nothing else, if you don't do anything else, please do that. It, it, it'll make a difference. Okay, one more question. Hi, my name is uh, Sonia. My, uh, Where oh, are you? Right here. Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Sonia. I'm the founder and CEO of Free From which is a national organization that helps survivors of domestic violence uh, build economic justice and uh, build their own financial independence. Uh, so we help survivors get compensation for the abuse, build their credit, and uh, build income through starting their own small businesses. So my question is for Carrie and for Janet. Um, financial abuse is one of the least talked about parts of domestic violence. And trans survivors of domestic violence or intimate partner violence ha uh, or, or suffer intimate partner violence in, in numbers that even uh, we can't imagine. And they're often left behind by the domestic violence. So economic justice, trans survivors, these are parts of uh, the movement to end gender-based violence that we talk about least. Mm. So how can we uh, work together to make sure that no one and no issue is left behind? Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I think a big part of it is, again, lifting the veil of shame. That a lot of times we say, why does she stay? Why do they stay? Why? And, and, and we're, here, we're telling you, we know in our work that the number one reason why people stay is because they don't feel like they have the tools to go. And all of us in this room, rather than shaming and blaming, can do, can use our resources, because if we're in this room, we have phenomenal financial resources to lend a hand to people who don't have access to that information to be able to transform their lives. I think really supporting what we do is we put the, the money that we raise goes back into local grassroots organizations. The money doesn't come from all state directly to people. You know, we really trust agencies and organizations that are on the ground in local communities who know how to do that work. But part of why we continue to do the work is that a huge percentage of calls that come into domestic violence centers aren't getting answered because we don't have enough staff to pick up the phone. So using your resources to give it to people who are doing the work is vital. It's vital, it's vital. And inviting everybody's voice to the table, remembering that we don't know everything about an issue because we know something about an issue. Mm -hmm. That just because we are a woman doesn't mean we know every woman's experience. Just because we're a person of color doesn't mean we know every person of color's experience. That we need those voices at the table. We need to have the courage to invite people who don't look like us, sound like us, think like us, or are from where we're from from into our worlds so that we can grow. And when we do that, we become better teams. We become stronger teams. We become teams that can address, we, that can, you know, in, in finance and in business world, saying, what's the problem? What's the solution? We, a lot of times, we don't even know what the problems are because not everybody is in the room to weigh in. If we invite everybody into our rooms of leadership, we can solve more problems and be more successful. And, you know, um, echoing what... Echoing what Carrie said is, you know, so much of the conversations I have with my community, specifically with trans women, is the sense of so much of the pain that we're going through, so much of the trauma, so much of the intimate partner violence stuff, as you noted, is underreported. Yeah. You know, oftentimes there are no safe spaces for us to go to. You know, Marsha P. Um, Sylvia Rivera, one of the pioneers of the trans rights movement, actually of the LGBT movement period, she was at the Stonewall Rebellion in 1969. One of the first speeches she gave in 1973 was about not feeling welcome in 
women shelters, um, knowing that she was being abused by heterosexual men who loved her, who desired her body but didn't want her to exist in public, um, knowing that there is so much shame and silence that goes into folk staying in these relationships and that our job is not to then go on top of that and shame them and to police them and to make them not feel as if they don't have a voice. And so I think that some of the most, the greatest things that folk can do asking what they can do is to speak this, to speak of the gaps, to realize and recognize who is not in the rooms, who are not, who are we not including in the conversations. And when we say women, ensuring that we're including women from all walks of life, disabled women, undocumented women, you know, um, trans women, gender nonconforming folk, right, and ensuring that we're creating um, bridges to make those, those gaps no longer exist. Right. Bravo. Yes. It's so interesting as we wrap up, the sign behind us says, what are you optimistic mm -hmm. about? When I hear women like the three who are here from all walks of life and then this room filled with outstanding individuals, that's why I'm optimistic. That's why my nieces who are seven and 11 and visited New York this weekend with just the biggest, brightest eyes looking toward their future of mooching off me for college money, <laughs> but nevertheless knowing that they have a role model like Janet, like Cecile, like Carrie, and like all of you. Like Tamron. Like Tamron, well, like Tamron exactly. We'll see. But, <laughs> but that's what I'm most optimistic about. I'm also op very optimistic when you see Forbes back this. Yeah. You know. Sure. When Forbes says, you know what, let's bring women together and not just talk about things on a light, superficial, mm -hmm. let's talk about topics that are difficult and let's redefine power. This is a luncheon, but this is a powerful luncheon and that's what we represent. So thank you, thank you to our- Thank you guys. Thank you, Cameron. Great job, Cameron. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.